It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery. Buck Bait. Better the Hunt. Rebel Six Rubs and Seasonings. Easy Cut. Limb Walker Game Calls. Sunrise Archery. Total Peep. Hunter's Blend Coffee. Packer Max. Fourth Arrow Camera Arms. Scent Blocker. Scent Lock. Copper Jazz. And Stanislavski Release Aids. Welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal, everybody. Host Mike Adams sitting in the cabin tonight. It's a little warm here. It's going to be the last warm day here in Michigan, I do believe. The front is coming through, and it's going to get nasty. So. You're right, it is. What's going on, Dan? You know what? Just like you said, the cold front, we're going to have a change in weather. It's October 1st this week. You know what that means. That means cold weather. It's time to get some Hunter's Blend, right? Well, it's that, and it's time to get out and get ready for bow season. Absolutely. Even though some of, some of it started already, but... You know, you got to do what you got to do. Well, you want to tell everybody how they can save some money? Absolutely. There is nothing better than getting out and helping our supporters as we speak. And I tell you what, if you want to start over what you see we're drinking right here, Hunter's Blend Coffee. Uh, If you want to start there, uh, go over to huntersblendcoffee.com. You get 10% off your order when you check out, when you use the promo code, as Mike points to it, capital U-N-J. There you go. And then Buck Bates. Absolutely. It's about that time to get your sense together. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you need some sense. And if you get over to buckbaits.com, you can get uh, 20% off your order when you check out using the promotional code Up North Journal. But after the harvest, after the killing, there's nothing better than grilling. And with <laughs> Rebel 6 Rubs, at rebel6rubs.com, you can get 20% off your order by using the code North Journal. There you go. And speaking of killing, that's kind of what we we're going to be talking about tonight, right? We are talking about what you use to kill absolutely it's they're sharp they're pointy yeah and they fly well yes they do we got brian anderson from g5 on hey brian how's it going tonight man hey guys good how are you guys uh i'm danny's got the heat turned on over here way too hot <laughs> dude and i'm waiting for that cold front to hit <laughs> yeah it was, it was uh it was nice it started to warm up so hopefully uh end of the week will be good for the starter yeah i can't wait to get out uh but actually uh, you just got back from a little jaunt didn't you yeah i've been uh trying to get as much in uh We've been jamming at work, but uh, we were able to sneak out. We went to uh, southeast corner of Idaho, just kind of a couple hundred miles north of Salt Lake, and uh, was able to chase some elk for a little bit. Um, Helped a buddy kill one. He killed a gray bull. A lot of work getting that off. And a couple opportunities, but no arrow shot by me, but it was uh, was a good week. They were bugling. They were... uh, in a couple more days seem like we'd probably be able to get a little bit, you know, put a couple more on the ground. So right on. Well, if you're out there chasing elk and you got your quiver with you, what what broadhead are you using? So elk? this year, um, I was using the new Striker Four Blade. Okay. Normally, I'm a big Montec guy. Um, that one's usually the one in the quiver, one of the Montecs. But this year, I was gonna uh, try the Striker Four Blade, just kind of put a little bit bigger hole in. Um, I mean, you got a big body, you want to be able to get them to bleed. So you know, a nice Four Blade will uh, will do that. So. So, so the striker four blade that you, that you have, mm-hmm. you'll have these diehards that say you need a three blade. You have these diehards that say four blade. Is there a, a monumental difference? Personal preference? What, what I think you- it's more of a personal preference thing. I mean, we've always kind of been the three blade broadhead to go to. Um, but I mean, there is a you know there is kind of a cult out there that just loves the four blade. Um, there's a lot of good four blades out there. I used them a long time ago before I worked at G5. Uh, um but yeah i mean the four blades i think are just it produces a little bit more of a hole you know but i mean same time you still have vertical lines which can fold up possibly but it's it's hard to say you know i mean do i think one's better than the other absolutely not i would say you know try what what your your heart wants and then uh kind of make sure it just tunes with your setup i'm a big four fletch guy anyway so i was like oh let's try it this year um i mean it really hasn't been much more than a montec in the quiver for the last five six seven years but i mean i always want to try new things and Let's, you know, we're constantly coming out with new broadheads, so. You know, and you've already got a compliment on, on the beard. You're rocking the beard. So you already <laughs> got you. that Mark Coleman out Thank there <laughs> rocking the beard. You're also rocking the four blade out there. But you've come up with, you know, going back, starting at the top of the lineup with the three blade, uh, you've kind mm-hmm. of gone and you've messed with the Montec a little bit. Yeah, it's uh, it was a broadhead I used before I even came to G5. I mean, that's kind of the reason I, you know, when they came to talk to me, it was, it was like, Absolutely, I want to I want to work with a company that I've uh, you know I've already been using and proud of. Um, so the Montec is kind of the tried and true, the the go to head that we've always 
Um, then G5, Montech. I mean, a lot of people don't even know the company's G5. They think it's Montech. Um, it's the number one selling fixed plate out there. And the, and the, thing, the cool part about it is it's one solid piece of steel. There's a lot of systems out there that are welded. There's a lot of pieces that, you know, you take them apart, like the striker, you can replace blades. And those are all great. They all work in their own purpose. Um, but the Montech is one piece when it starts. It's one piece when it's finished. And the uh, nice thing about that is, is, I mean, on bigger game like elk and things like that, I mean, if you do stick the offside shoulder or, you know, bust through a rib, I mean, it's it's a very robust, it's a very hardy system. I mean, you're talking 80, 90,000 six blades compared to 20 or 30 on some of the other stuff. Um stronger and uh we've been able to build on that the last couple of years um with the montech people wanted one that was sharper because it is a 90 degree blade or sorry 60 degree blade angle um where most blades are about 20 so you know if you put your thumb on it, it may not necessarily cut you don't do it uh, we have more <laughs> stories about stuff like that later um but we've been able to kind of improve and improve and improve on it one second yep hey dude i'm uh I'm on the phone. Can you go inside for a little bit? <laughs> here, come here real quick. Bring them on. Bring them on. We love seeing kids. Here's the future bow hunter of the family. Oh, man. I, I see deer deer hanging on your wall here from this little guy. You have deer on your wall already in your bedroom? Yeah. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> Is he shooting a bow already? He's just starting to play a little bit. There you oh. go. <laughs> Bird. 15 birds yeah all right a lot of birds all right go back inside buddy <laughs> hey that's um, that's our future man we've got to get them involved too exactly so it's uh it's been fun and my dad's been kind of wanting to spoil him too he's been waiting a while we we're uh me and my brother both older when we had kids so and it's kind of see uh my dad's kind of one of those uh i don't say hard ass cops my whole life well, right right grandkids softened him up so <laughs> it, it has a tendency to do that grandkids <laughs> mine has done the same thing to me but uh, yeah, so talking back at the Montech, the Montech has been the tried and true. It's been the one that's been in my quiver forever. Um, but the last couple of years, we've been able to try to improve on it without trying to take the uh, the internal structure away to it. Because I mean, yeah, it is. I would say the blade angle is a little more choppy than it is a slice, kind of like some of the broadheads. Um, so people have complained about that. So what we've done is we can't change that blade angle, but we can change how we're doing it. So we went to a carbon steel um, that made it uh, about 10 points of Rockwell hardness. Worked great, but then you had to maintain it. And then um, this, this past year, we came out with a brand new one called the Montech M3. So any we were, we're ones to listen to our customers. We want to know what they have to say and they have to feel about it. They wanted a sharper one, so we, we went with a 420 stainless. It's the same thing you see in a lot of broadheads that are way, way expensive the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. I think there's kind of a, a boutique brands that kind of go at that hundred dollars for three broadheads right we, we're producing the, the new m3 at the same same steel same quality everything like that um right around that 40 40 price point nice um but then what we've also been able to do so that one even went up 10 points more hard on the rockwell scale um than the carbon steel so now we're at close to 60 points of rockwell and then we also got rid of the vents in the blade so um you want a vented blade if it's got a thin blade if you go super thick on the blade it can push some air and cause some noise um so we went to a non-vented system i actually have it right here um if i can kind of show it to you so we went from uh where there would be a vent in the side of the blade to actually kind of like an airfoil so uh, we've been able to and that made it a little stronger too so we had the strongest the sharpest um and by far the most wicked and quietest montech we've ever had so well, okay you mentioned something there that, that we've we've kind of talked about and i want to go ahead and bring it up uh, mm-hmm. about the montech because i've shot the montech for years i mean yeah. I, I, I i've shot him for quite a while last year I, I took a poke uh, 44 yards on a buck, and it was a dead shot, and I'm like dead deer walking as I'm watching the arrow come into him, and at the very last second, that, that buck actually pushed off the ground and launched upwards, like a, I call him Matrix buck for what he did, but it went underneath his brisket, and actually a buddy of ours in Iowa asked what broadhead we were shooting, and he said that the vented blade might have caused a whistle. Is that it's it, it's definitely a possibility. I mean, okay. you don't see it as much, like I said, on a on a stamp blade or a, a replaceable blade system. Um, but you're at twenty thousand thickness, you know. So when the air kind of just ro- rolls right over it, or I mean, we were eighty five thousand, ninety thousand thick on the blade. I mean, it definitely can cause. We've heard guys say, you know, I've heard a whistle the whole way, and then we've heard guys that say, oh no, it's the quietest broadhead ever. So I don't know if it's aerodynamics or uh, combinations, but I, I definitely think there's a possibility there was a little noise, and that's. That's one thing we listen to, you know, and we still love the Montech. We're still going to make the Montech, and it's still 
going to be that bread and butter of the company. But if a guy wanted an option at a bet, you know, a, I would say a better mousetrap, um, the M3 is going to be the way to go. But it's going to take care of those little things like possibly a longer distance shot, you know, with noise. Um, and that's one thing, too. I mean, with the bows nowadays, the arrow setups – um, 45 yards, 50 yards isn't out of the question anymore. I mean, right. I don't recommend it, but you know, if you're shooting 80, 90 yards in your backyard, you know, if you feel comfortable at 40, 50 and you think you have an opportunity, you know, and you're confident, I would say go for it, you know, and that's, you know, some of these broadheads are going to be able to give you those options a little better at those distances. I'm glad you said that. We, Danny and I, we, we covered this question so much on the show talking about, you know, what your effective range is, you know, and there's, there's a lot of people that, that tend to give, people like us a little bit of grief for for taking a longer 40 50 yard shot but like you said when you're practicing you know 80 90 100 yards in your backyard it it it, your effective range just gets out there a little bit further it gives you that extra opportunity to take a shot absolutely like i said i'm not telling you to go out there and take that shot but if you are having the opportunity i mean like every summer see you guys up at TAC, you know and when you get on a course and you shoot one at 127 yards and it actually felt good and it was where you aimed and it went, um, you know, I'm not saying that's ever going to happen in the mountains or while we're hunting, but I mean, to be able to take that confidence that you did at that kind of distance and doing at 40, 50, I mean, at a deer mm-hmm. that's a little bit out of the wind zone, right. um, you know, elk, you know, things that, you know, antelope things that you may not be able to get into that 15, 20 yards where we've always been comfortable at. And, right. I mean, the opportunity's there, you know. The, the, you know, you, you just said it in a nutshell. What you feel comfortable for. With. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. it, it, whether it's you feeling comfortable at whatever distance, me, Mike, anybody, what you feel comfortable. Don't don't press it. Don't you feel comfortable? No. Shoot it. Well, everybody's and, and, ethical shot is, it, is a different distance. Exactly. It's not, yeah. you know, you see these guys pull off these amazing shots. Yep. But they've practiced it and they've taken grief for it. But like you said, Brian, it's what you're comfortable, what you practice, and what's ethical. Absolutely. Exactly. I think ethical is probably the biggest word there. I mean, if you're, you have confidence and you have, you know, I mean, you have the ability to shoot that, then that, that's going to give you more opportunities to be able to put yourself in more hunting situations, you know? So, but I don't, I don't recommend it for a guy that's just getting out there and starting to shoot, you know, 20 yards is your, your effective zone. Stay at 20 yards, you know, yeah. that buck may walk past that, but Hey, you know, now you need to figure out how to get closer to it in your hunting. Or, you know, hopefully the next time he comes cruising through, he's just a little bit closer. Absolutely. And, and, and you guys are making the tools to go on the end of our arrows to be able to take a, that little bit longer shot, too. Uh, exactly. And I, that's what I like about you guys. You know, you listen, you listen to people and you make little tweaks here and there and make it better. We're the family, you know, the grace. G5 stands for grace. It also um, five biblically. And mm-hmm. then also there's five grace kids. So that's what G5 stands for. Um, but they've always been in precision grinding. We've done... You wouldn't believe the companies we've worked with. If, if there's a company having a problem making a part, they come to us to figure out how to make it. Um, so we do stuff for the gun industry, the uh, workout equipment, uh, medical industry. Um, I mean, broadheads aren't only part of what we do. It's kind of what we fell into because it was more of the passion of the family. Sure. Um, it's all about making a better mousetrap, a better precision part. So, I mean, they weren't going to come out with a broadhead that could have wobbles and things like that. I mean, every single Montec goes through an optical comparator where it fits within, you know, thousand, ten thousandths of an inch um, at the very point of it. I mean, we've actually had other broadhead companies buy our Montec to be able to spin theirs, have a comparison of what's straight, what's not. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's been our, it's our, it's always been our passion to make sure what we, what we try to put out there, what we put on the end of an arrow, what's going to be on the end of the arrow for the guy that's, you know, chasing does in his backyard or the guy that's climbing a mountain to kill a mountain goat we want to make sure he's going to have the best experience possible absolutely and i and i tell you what we're going to come up on our first break but when we come back we're going to continue our discussion about broadheads and we're going to talk about the uh the dead meat and the mega meat when we okay, get back. absolutely all right we're going to step outside we'll be right back after this pse archery has reinvented the way you buy bows From now on, you can make the most educated decision possible by basing your bow choice specifically on your shooting needs and goals. All you need to do is ask yourself, what kind of shooter am I? What do I want to achieve? PSE will help find the right category for you. So, what kind of shooter are you? Find out at PSEArchery.com.
Welcome back. Second segment. Sitting here doing a little chatting about some broadheads and hunting and killing stuff tonight with Brian Anderson from G5 Outdoors. Uh, you got some yeah, I got, one of our I, listeners, I do, Danny. We, we, in the first segment, we talked about the G5 and the M3. Uh, question is, uh, where can they get the new M3? Okay, so as a lot of people are probably noticing in a lot of different outdoor industries, the parts are starting to be harder and harder to find on the shelves from golf equipment to hunting. It's the same thing right now. I mean, we are producing and making more broadheads than we ever have in our career and we're shipping them as fast as we make them i mean that's nice thing about being a domestic company um i would just say call your local dealers we're most dealers have stuff on order or we've already shipped um we are a little behind on some of the shipping this year just for that reason i mean i think people came out of covid and uh they're still staying a little social distancing so they're doing a little hunting you know so um i would say just check check um Check any stores, Amazon. I hate to people sit in there, um, but Bass Pro, Cabela's, Sportsman's Warehouse might be online sources, but I would always check your local dealers. I mean, um, one thing you'll know about, or you guys probably don't know about us, we don't put it on our website unless we're fulfilling our dealers first. Uh, we like to take care of our customers, but our dealers are the heart of it. And we want to make sure if a guy goes to a shop, he can find them locally, and we'd rather do that than kind of undercut those guys. So if, the, you, you, if you see it not on our website, just keep looking at other places there is, they are out there. All right, cool. Good answer. Uh, great answer, actually. But like you said, check with the dealer first and then mm-hmm. go from there. Uh, okay, so let's go to the broadheads. Uh, we'll start with the dead meat. It's the one that's out there. It's a three blade. Uh, we do have a question about the dead meat itself. And the question is, why do they? Why does uh, Corey's rattle? Okay, so we, uh, we got to make sure we, our, our broadheads function the best they can. So the... the um, Mega meat and the dead meat are a continuation of our broadhead from the Tekken line, Tekken, Tekken 2, um, down to the uh, T3, um, which always pin the front of the broadhead um, to the back. What what problem with that is, is it put a lot of pressure on the front end um, and could restrict opening. So what we've done is we've made all the connection points on the very back of the broadhead. Um, so you, it just clicks in the back and now the front free floats. So our, we, we try to keep it as precision as we can, but if we took the gap of the, the blade any tighter, there's a possibility that you might have any kind of gunk and blood can get in there and, and keep it from opening. Um, so if you are getting a slight rattle, that's just to that blade in the track. Um, take the blades and deploy them. Take a little bit of string wax and just kind of put a little bit in that groove because that won't freeze um, and that'll keep it waterproof and keep anything from going in there and then just snap them back in place and that'll take care of that rattle. Great tip. Wow. Yeah. You so string wax. It's, it's, something, it's something we noticed internally. We were shooting them and we could actually hear them inside our quiver going a little bit. Um, so Nate did tighten up the tolerances a little bit, but we've learned just to put a little wax, white lithium grease. Wax tends to hold a little better than grease and it doesn't smell. So Yeah, you don't want any smell on there. So yeah, that, that man, that's a great tip. I mean, you, you get that right, right from the company. You know, and, and the, yeah. the best yeah, they called in, they said it. That's what we tell you to do is just put a little smear, just smear it right on the track, push the blade in. It does no restrictions. It'll actually lubricate your broadhead and take care of that all in one. And the best part is, you know. You, you, you can picture this in your mind, these guys out in the field hearing this, and all of a sudden they're back at the camp that night, and they're tearing these things apart. Trying <laughs> oh, yeah, to figure beating out. on the side of their bow. You guys listen to shoot it, you know? Yeah. yeah. We've, we've been there. You know, we do those things ourselves. So, yeah. Nope, I can I can totally understand if somebody got that and had a little bit of frustration, but it's it's a really quick, easy fix. That go. is awesome. You know, and, and from there, you went from dead meat, now available, with 25% available. more meat with a huge oh, two-inch it, cut is the mega meat and it has been epic it really has been huge um so we were a little late to the launch on that we just started shipping them in june we were hoping a little bit for turkey season it's our first three blade two um two inch cut um we tried a two blade two cut which hey the industry loves them rage has been a, a trooper they are awesome we specialize in three blades so we decided all right let's uh let's look at what we can do the, the dead meat was such a hit at inch and a half um, so the problem is, is they're so hard to get right now. I couldn't even really find one in a package. So I grabbed one that we, uh, smash in our guillotine at work, but this is one through a quarter inch piece of aluminum and it just looks absolutely brand new, but it is a two inch cut. It's producing entrance holes. Like we've never seen, um, search our Facebook page. Um, look at the bone collectors. I mean, everybody that's using this broadhead this year has just been having absolutely amazing success with i mean one we're i'm giddy here because it's not normally me and just the amount of blood and the amount of these giant holes entrance and exits have been out of this world i mean we were even nervous being a two inch cut you go there's not a lot of guys that are going to go out west with that michael waddell put a giant bull down last week with one 
um, just kind of looking at some of the comments on uh, some of the social media pages. And uh, we kind of cruise um, some of the, uh, the big box stores like Bass Pro and Cabela's and look at their comments. There's a lot of guys hunting out west with them and doing absolutely great things. So That is cool, man. Hold that thing back up again. I want to see yeah. that. So it's quarter inch steel. I mean, uh, aluminum. Oh, aluminum, quarter inch aluminum. So, yep. so it's, uh, we actually drop them at the force of about 140 pounds. We, we do it because we want to break stuff and we continuously have these cool little things on our desk because ours don't break and most others do. So, <laughs> um, same thing with all the rest of our broadheads. It's an all steel ferrule. I mean, it's, it's super strong, super tough all steel blades, no rubber collar. And I mean, basically I could take this broadhead and really, if I want to pop it out of here and hunt with it tomorrow with no problem. That's wild. Yeah, it is that, you know, it's just one of those things. What that just proved to you is, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to give credit to all the companies that you, you get out there and, and you get out there and you put that thing, like you said, 140 pounds through aluminum testing it. You want to break it. You want to see what oh, yeah. you we're, can we're do. We're looking for failure points. I mean, we start with, this isn't the first rendition of this broadhead. We start, we break, we fly. I mean, we have a wind tunnel in the office. We try to do aerodynamics. Um, you know, same thing with our BMP. We match our ballistics of our uh, practice points to our broadheads. Um, you know, we got try to go to the thing and we try to get these things so they're as indestructible as you can. I mean, most guys are probably not going to shoot a broadhead twice, but we do hear it all the time. Hey, you know, I had an issue or something like that. Or, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll help. We'll replace, you know I mean? There's, we try to do everything we can. There is things that happen, um, you know, and, and blades do break, bend, things like that. But we, we do everything on the front side to make sure 99% of that stuff never happens. You know, and, and speaking of what you just talked about, the BMP, uh, the ballistics mm-hmm. match practice, practice tip, Ex- explain that. We got it up on the screen there and explain what that's all about. Yeah, so we originally had um, a broadhead called the preseason Montec, and it's a Montec that's dull. That's all it is. We actually um, started with those a long time ago. People loved them. The problem with the practice broadhead is you can't pull it out of a target. You have to shoot it into a broadhead target. They beat them up. They chop them up. And then you have a target that you're shooting the rest of the year, which is a bag or a Celsius bales or 3D targets. Um, you know, you and then what happens is you're shooting those all year, then you get your broadheads on and they're off. All right, mm-hmm. now you're moving your sights or trying to tune your bow to your broadheads. Um, so, and sometimes they match up. A lot of times they do. A lot of times, more than not, they don't. Um, so Nate wanted to come up with a process that was a field point. We didn't want to call it a field point because it's much more than that. Um, but we have one made for every broadhead that we're designing right now. So there's one for the Montec, one for the Striker. Um, the Striker four blade hasn't come out yet, but we're working on that one. The Mega Meat, the Dead Meat. And what it is, it's, I'll say it, a field point, but it's a field point that flies exactly like your broadhead. So you can shoot these things in 3D targets, bag targets, whatever kind of targets you want all year long. Screw it off the day before hunting, put your broadheads on, and you have the confidence to go out there and hunt without... And I'm not saying not to shoot a broadhead. People do, but you wouldn't have to. You could put this on and shoot it exactly as your field point or as your broadhead and go hunting the next day. Okay, so the what's uh, what's the retail on these? Um, I think they're right around 14 15 bucks for a three-pack. So they're a little okay. bit more, okay. um, but it's something, like I said, that you won't have to do any tuning with. Um, and, and, mo- and all the mechanicals will come with one in the package. So Mega Meats and um, Dead Meats are going to have one in the package. So if somebody wanted to try it, they can go that way first, and then hey, if they fall in love with it, they, they can get a whole set for their arrows. Gotcha. That's pretty cool. That, yeah, that's a I great mean, idea. We appreciate that. It. It's just it's something different, and you know, I mean, we wanted people to be confident in their equipment. It's another way to get guys more confident right before season without having to switch and frust, you know, get all frustrated and have to do all that stuff just days before hunting season. Right. And yeah. those are specific to each broadhead. Yep. Okay. Not so not just the grain weight, but obviously the broadhead style as well. Yeah, yep, yep. The Montex will have theirs, M3s will have theirs, uh, strikers. And you'll notice if you held all of them up, they're a slightly different shape. They, they don't have fins, but they kind of, they do have scallops and things like that. They're going to follow the trajectory and, and basically transfer the wind the same way a broadhead would. So would you also use those for crossbows? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. All right. I mean, you can anything that you shoot a normal field point for, put a BMP on it. If you're gonna, if if it was me and you're gonna shoot a G5 product, shoot BMPs all year. Switch your broadheads out right for a season. Go hunt. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so we talked about the front with the the wax tip. Another question is: talk to the threading. How do you keep them tight in the shaft? Okay. 
Um, it's kind of like a field point. I mean, eventually they're going to rattle loose. Wax or bow wax is always a good one. It's something I always put on mine at the beginning of the year. Um, we used to make a product called VibraCheck. Um, just wasn't very popular, so we didn't want to keep it on the shelf and, and create a product that wasn't any good. But there is some Loctites that if you want to put on the threads and let it dry, not put it on the threads and thread it in, just put it on. It kind of fills up some space. Um, you can do those things, cotton, you put cotton on the threads, it'll kind of do it tight. We didn't want to put an O-ring on the back or anything like that because we want a metal to a square finish. Um, I don't know if we've talked about it, but we make a tool called the ASD that squares the ends of your arrows. Um, so we want metal to the carbon, the aluminum, the steel, whatever you're using at the end. And if you put a wash or an O-ring down in there, um, it tends to cause a wobble, wobble. So that's why you'll see always metal to metal connections on ours and there isn't rubber or anything like that. But I would just, I put string wax as my go-to, put it on there. You might have to do it twice a year, um, but no, I mean, it, put it on, stride it tight. Oh, and another thing is broadhead wrenches are important. We make one called a Torquey. Um, damn, I wish I had one. It actually has two little tabs. It's, it's an actual torque wrench. And uh, the human hand does about three pounds of pressure to hold on. Our little torque, you basically, it's, it looks just like any other really broadhead wrench, um, but there's a line in the middle that you can actually twist it. It's made out of rubber. It's not made out of plastic. Um, and there's two little points. And once those points touch, it's like six to eight pounds of pressure. So it's twice the um, amount of pressure that a human can put on there with their hands or a, just a normal broadhead wrench. Okay, yeah, we actually got a picture of it up on the, on the line oh, right cool. now. So. so, yeah, I mean, if somebody wants one and not have to worry about them ever coming loose, Put them on there with a torque you can't break them free with your hands after that nice so it's it was something uh lou the the owner um the main owner it's owner uh father and two sons um kind of one of his kooky ideas that we are well, that's i don't know if that'll ever work and we we basically all lost the bet if we could unscrew a broadhead afterwards and we're like, <laughs> we gotta bring that one for the people so uh that's good stuff all right, so and I think the price there was like 795 on the web page yeah yeah, yeah, yeah right so, around seven eight bucks yeah. yep so there you Definitely go. worth the price, and yeah, I mean, not, not, a normal broadhead wrench is three to five bucks, so it's just a couple of dollars more to actually be able to have one that will lock your broadheads in place. I mean, it was like I said, it was overly impressive when we kind of came down with it. We're like, yeah. all right, and keeps your fingers off the blades. Don't have to worry about cutting your fingers either. We'll yeah, talk exactly. about safety yeah. in the next segment, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, yeah, and I'm, I'm an accident-prone guy. I mean, I we had another story earlier, but, I mean, I cut the end of my finger off a couple months ago. I mean, I need anything to keep me myself from cutting myself. Actually, so, yeah, there's a tor- <laughs> Dan yeah, Numer uses plumber's tape. Oh. Yeah, that would work, too. So, um, yeah, just same thing. Just wrap it on there. Do it the opposite thread, just like you do plumber's. And that way, when you screw it on, it stays tight. It doesn't back itself off. But, yeah, Teflon tape works great. Alan and Mark both use the Torquey. Yeah, and it says it's a must-have tool. Nice, yep. good deal. See, isn't now what what's great about that is you're, you're you're putting products out there that people are using. Like you said, you had the the Loctite type that wasn't getting there, and you just didn't want to carry it on the shelf, so you get rid of it. Yeah, and, I mean, it was it's a cool product. It was made for because we do uh, fletching glue called blue glue, so we brought it out at the same time, um, which is great. It pretty much dries clear, but it's blue. I have terrible eyes and. You can see it go on the fletching. So same thing there, just making products that are a little bit more easy friendly for the end user. And it was a product that, you know, it had a shelf life and we didn't want to just put a product on the shelf to sell it. So um, we pulled it back off, but it's still a product called VibraCheck out there. That's very, I mean, it's made by the same company. Um, yeah, I mean, and the same thing with the ASD. We So we focus on broadheads and bows. We talked about that earlier as an internal company, but we also like to make things that help people hunt or do their own arrows, um, things like that. We have an ASD that um, helps square the into both ends of the arrows we change it this year so you can do a lot more types of arrows inserts outserts that kind of stuff with it um you know to to crowd a you know better service for your broadheads better spins um yeah a lot of that stuff just to kind of make it easier for the end user you know i didn't know you had blue glue i i've yeah i've got to get get some of that because that's a big problem i've got is seeing making sure you've got the right amount of glue on a fletching before you apply those little pockets and yeah Yeah. say you just put a nice blue line down it and you're good to go i mean if you have a white wrap with a white vein you'll see a little bit of blue on the side but pretty much any other combo it dries pretty much crystal clear i i don't think i don't think it matters when it when you turn it red right (laughs) i don't i don't care if it's blue purple yellow when you turn it red it's all good on the other side of an animal than they ever do before they go in and brian you keep on talking and we got dan newmar on the ropes he's seriously thinking of switching to g5 after years of shooting slick tricks there you go he's thinking and uh, if he's a Slick Trick fan, Striker X is the way to go. That four blade, I mean, like I said earlier, those guys are kind of a cult following. And once they fell in love with it, 
and it was something that we we knew we needed to do, but we also wanted to make sure we redid the striker first. So yeah, I would say striker or striker X would be an awesome combo for somebody that was coming from Slick Trick. There uh, you go. All righty, we got another break coming up, but we got more questions going into the next segment. All right, I tell you what, we're gonna step outside, take care of some business, and when we come back. We'll continue the conversation here, talking more with Broadheads with Brian Anderson from G Five Outdoors. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now. The most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Third segment of the show, lots of good conversation going on, a lot of interaction back and forth, people watching and listening to the show right now. Uh, you said that you, you had some more questions? Yeah, or? Dan Anderson, all the way on the other side of our Great Lake Pond, Yeah, uh, wants to know, actually, it, actually, I think what I think the, I already know the answer, but it, it, it's mechanical or solid head? What, 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 what? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> oh, he asked that the dirty question. Those questions, you know. Um, I mean, I would, I'm gonna call him. We're like the self declared kings of fixed blades, you know. I mean, the Montech has been our go to. I mean, it's been our bread and butter. I mean, like I said earlier, a lot of people know the company is Montech. Mm-hmm. Um, you're always gonna have minimal failures with a fixed blade broadhead. You have an exposed cutting blade. Um, your blades are already set. I mean, they're they're. But there is tuning sides of it. I mean, you have more wings out there. You have more foilers, things like that, that could possibly, um, you know, at longer distances or somebody that has a bow that not necessarily maybe the tune the best. So you kind of got to fight that battle. Um, mechanicals always tend to have bigger cutting diameters. So um, bigger holes, more blood, you know, things like that. But they're also um, take more kinetic energy to open and make sure that they have a good entrance hole and exit hole. Um, we definitely try to do that by having better sweeping blade angles. Um, a lot of them have very, you know, to get two and three inch cuts on some of these mm-hmm. new broadheads, you have very chopping blade angles, um, where we wanted to go more sweeping that 40 degrees, things like that. Um, so it's, you know, half dozen, the other, but on that same side, it, it is a smaller compact broadhead when it's closed. So longer distance shooting, um, hunting out West, things like that, you know, you may be able to get a mechanical to group a little better or be able to get tuned out to a little bit better distance. Um, well-tuned bow, you should be able to shoot both very far. I mean, um, I was sighted, I mean, sighted in 80 plus yards for the elk hunt we just got back on and I, I'd have been confident at that kind of distance with a fixed blade if it came to it. Um, you know, there's, there's that, you know, so, um, I think it's just kind of personal preference and figure out which one you like and which one, you know, kind of, you know, satisfies that, that blood thirst when you, you see it on the ground, you know, do you, you know, do you have good blood, do you have good entrance and exits holes, stay with that. What, which one makes you happy? Yeah. So to answer the question, yes. Yeah. <laughs> for both. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can battle for an hour on that particular question. Oh, so. oh that, if, if, if that's one of the, the great questions. If you want to just kind of throw like the, the grenade into a, a hunting conversation, oh, just God. throw that one. Just like compound to crossbow same yeah. thing yeah i had a buddy reach out today and saying the same thing he's like hey we need to talk about broadheads i'm mean, first get rid of the comp the crossbow and get a real bow and we can talk you know but <laughs> no i mean honestly people out there hunting i'm happy with whatever makes them happy to hunt you know so okay well you, you brought up crossbow let's just throw this out there real quick for, for the crossbow shooters yeah. uh they're looking for a, a broadhead to put on the end of a bolt uh and they're gonna hunt deer wherever what what are you going to recommend that they put on the end of that um, I'm a big guy on mechanicals for crossbows. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of kinetic energy. Um, they fly very true, you know, very compact. So I would say a mega meat or a dead meat would be an awesome, awesome combo on the front. Um, personally, my dad has been a crossbow guy a long, long time and he's, he's a big striker fan. Um, but he also has strikers and dead meats in the, in the quiver. But I, 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 I would say dead meat or mega meat would be my go-to okay i agree i, 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 I that, that's what i guys. use yeah that's when i use the crossbow i use dead meats Not and here's out. something we and i can we test all of our broadheads we actually found kind of a mathematical formula that kind of shows you how much tension you need on a broadhead for speed wise and we do all of that testing on it as long as it says crossbow in our version of broadhead so mega meat dead meat make sure you get the red collars which is the crossbow version 
speed is not a factor. So the guys that are shooting those 450 plus crossbows that, I mean, mm-hmm. just lightning fast, they don't have to worry about pre-deployment. Okay. Exactly. And that's a very good point, Brian, because I've had guys when I've been in the stores grab a pack and say, oh, I'm going to use this on the crossbow. I said, hold on, wait, 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 check the yep. collars. They got to be the red check. collars. It'll, or it'll say on all the packaging. Like our yes. packaging looks like um, meat packaging. Just look on the stamp on the bottom. It'll say, um, but look for the red collars. And here's the deal on that too, is if you're a bow hunter and they don't have the blue collars, grab the crossbow collars. They're never going to have any problem opening up. They just hope it, you know, they'll hold it in flight. So okay. um, you can use them both for bow hunting but we recommend just the crossbow collars for, for crossbows. Okay, we got that up on there now. Danny, put your cursor right there on the collar, what we're talking about. That's the blue right one here. right this there. This is the blue one. And and I got I got a I got a question for you. I'm looking we're looking at that picture. Are those still metal clips? Uh no, no. So the T three was the last version um that we had the metal clip on and basically what it was there's two flats on the blades and two metal fingers that kind of pressed up yeah um now we use a polymeric gland which is basically a a fancy word for uh plastic but Mm -hmm. i mean it's 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 special in how the tensions are made and things like that um and basically there's a detention system that snaps in so um on the mega meat there's a ball on the back of the blade that slips into a collar that clicks in um and then on the mega meat there's actually the um so basically there's a ball and socket um, one and then the mega meat is the socket is on the blade and the ball is on the broadhead. Um, so basically, it's just opposite, but they hold the same way. Okay. That's the difference on yeah, because the mega meat um, has a stamp blade like uh, the, the striker or any kind of mostly replaceables, um, and the mega meat is a molded blade like our Montec and things like that. So we're able to do a little bit more um, design on the blade uh, than a flat stamp. But uh-huh. if people wanted a big giant cut, that's what you're going to get with the sharpness on the mega meat. So okay. A two inch cut that, that, that's a big cut that's it's huge. a giant cut I mean, <laughs> so we were we we're pretty excited to see what the, the you know we were, we killed a lot of animals and did a lot of testing early on and we just had great luck and uh so we were a little you know, just nervous to kind of see what it was in the real life and uh it's been amazing to see entrance holes on a two inch cut broadhead i mean it's always great to have that big exit hole um but man these entrance and exit holes are just been I tell everybody go look at T Bone's video of that 182 he just shot. It'll it, it'll he'll show you everything you need to see on that broadhead. Let the air out of him quick. <laughs> oh God, did it ever! Oh man. All right, we got a question for you. If you shoot a mechanical no. or a fixed at 30 yards, will they hit the same spot? So more than likely, yes. But we talked about it earlier with the BMP. So they the reason we make them different is because they fly the characteristics of that particular broadhead. Um, a well-tuned bow, 30 yards, more than likely you're going to be pretty close to the same hole. I mean, but you could be off an inch here and there. And more than likely, what a lot of people don't realize is it's not necessarily the blades that are out there that make that much difference, which they do. It's the distance from the broadhead to the point of the broadhead to your arrow. So front of center is a big talk. Everybody's talking about heavy front of centers and things like that. Um, our broadheads are all steel, Montec, Striker, all that. So they're very short when it comes to weight. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're very blessed to say our Montec flies really close to our mechanicals or our Striker flies close because they're all very short in the barrel of 100 grain in steel. If you took like a Rage or somebody else's broadheads and compared it to maybe our fixed blades, um, you're probably going to see a difference in flight um, between the two just because the, the length has changed um, and that weight ratio has changed. So your front of center is different. That's what's making your impact more different than so they haven't blades out there okay that makes sense makes sense yeah. and it goes back to practice 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 yeah right. practice, shoot them all like i said if they have a practice point shoot them all and see that they you know they make sure you know like i said it's front of center has been a big talk and i'm not going to get into that but i mean all that stuff does make a difference on um you know how your arrow flies how your arrow flexes out of the bow so when you change something small it can compound you know as, as you go 20 yards may not be that bad but 40 or 50 may be off further so just just keep an eye on that stuff. Absolutely, you know, and that, that's a that's a that's a great tip. And you, you know, what? we've been talking about all these broadheads and everything. Where can people go to find and take a look at these? Um, so most dealers, I mean, most all of our dealers. So if you're, you know, the most shop, most towns, things like that have a lot of local broadheads, uh, or sorry, local archery shops. Um, but you can also go to Bass Pros, Cabela's, um, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, um, you know, even even uh, Michigan, we're a Michigan company. Meyer Meyer has uh, um, our Montec on the shelf. Um, they also carry the dead meat. Um, some WalMarts, things like that. So there is a lot of opportunities. Go onto our dealer locator and just kind of type in, you know, your area. There should find some dealers around you that have some product in, on the shelves. 
Yep. I, I can't say that enough. Support your local dealers. That's that's where yep. we need to be going is our local shops. Uh, you, know. you know, and, we, and we're we blessed in Michigan. I mean, we're blessed in the Great Lakes to have such awesome shops everywhere. I mean, there's not a, there's a lot of them and there's a lot of good ones. Absolutely. You know, and that, that's, that's the thing. Uh, great dealers, great company, great local company here in Michigan to deal with. Thank and you. we, you know, we've been dealing with you for, gosh, it seems like years. <laughs> Don't say it because like I mean, we're beard. getting old. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we bought, Before it, the beard even. So. Well, it, it, well, you start watching our kids all grow up and you start, you kind of push yep. the age factor. Well, too. actually, but it, I'll step back a little bit. I When I first started shooting archery and I had my bow tuned, he was the guy that tuned my bow for me out in Goodrich. You remember that? Yeah. That, you know, I tell people, and they, you know, people ask me, they're like, well, you know, how long have you been? And I'm like, I've been in the outdoor industry since I was 12. And they're like, that right. can't be a thing. <laughs> I started between eighth and ninth grade, and I was at Browns for 10 years. Right. There so, you go. That was a long yeah, time. I want to say 2000. I everybody's bows. I still get the phone calls from a lot of those guys. You still do it? I'm like, they still do great work up there. And like, you know, yeah. that's it. You know, I, I grew up in it. My dad was a shooter for PSE. You know, that's why I you know, was able to see you guys even more uh, as we got older. And, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, Jim, you know, before he passed, you know, we spent a lot of time over there. You know, it's uh, it's it's a it's a big community, you know. You see it in those shops and then you know, that's part of you may not spend a lot of money at some of those shops, you just hang out and there's a lot of guys that spend a ton of money in those shops, you know, but it's kind of some of the hearts of the community. There's been a lot of coffee and a lot of conversation in those shops, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I oh, do. Yeah. I, I think it was two thousand six or seven when I, I met you out there at Browns. I mean it's it's been it's been a few days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just uh, I was thinking. I mean, setting up your boy when he was young, you know. So, yep. Yep. Um, yeah, it's just been part of who I am, and I still do it for a lot of my buddies. You know, it's uh, it's a, it's you know, it's something you can do with your friends. It's something you can get together. You know, go to the shop, get your stuff, and you know, go shoot and spend that time together. So you, you know, and, and and you you brought up Jim, and and, and it's going to be a year here, um, and so. A year but, today, wasn't it? I think so. I think Jim oh, passed. Was close. I didn't know it was today. I think it was today. 27th. It might be. Today's um, 28th. Today's 27th. 27th. I, yeah. You know, and that leads us. I'm going to go right into our next segment about safety. And, and have, we're, we're dads here, and we've got kids to yep. come home to and everything. And safety is the number one issue. And you had an incident that happened last year that uh, it basically, I don't know if you were seeing the light, but it, you. you uh, you were knocking yeah, on the door or something. Opened our eyes. I've always, been, I've always been pretty safe, but I've always kind of been a clumsy guy. You know, that's it's always been me. I'm I'm not the most uh, athletic figure out there. And uh, yeah, I uh, I had a I had a pretty close one last year. I was uh, I was hunting in Kansas and um, had some pretty good bucks out in the field. And uh, you guys are gonna laugh because when people hear Brian was stalking a deer, they just gonna laugh at that anyways. <laughs> but um, actually had a pretty good opportunity at some really good deer. I snuck to an edge of a field. I uh, had a really good buck out there. Um, and I looked down the field a couple hundred yards, and it was one of those bucks you you do anything to do to try to get an arrow into. Um, so I was working down the field edge, had arrow in the bow the whole time, and you uh, know um, work at the edge. You know still had the buck out to the right. It's I, I don't know why it didn't run off. I mean it was wide open. Um, but it had a little spot in the field where I could get around the edge of it, and uh, I was going to try to get an arrow in this deer. Um, and my buddy, I, my buddy pulled up to pick me up, and uh, you know, and I was just about to get full draw on the deer when I come around the corner, and uh, my buddy yelled, "Don't shoot! It's the wrong deer!" And I'm like, and I looked up, and he was right. I was just so concentrated on seeing bodies and working it. It was getting to the point where you know it was right at that time, and uh, you know, at the end of the night, and. Uh, it was probably a buck that I could have shot, but I didn't go to Kansas to kill a small buck, and the big one was just inside the woods in front of it. Um, and obviously him yelling blew everything out, which is good because I could have killed the wrong deer anyways. Um, and don't take me as a big buck killer because that's not it. I just had a better <laughs> opportunity at that one because I'm from Michigan like everyone else. So um, And, um, yeah, so it was kind of hectic and just kind of getting, you know, um, and at that particular point I, I, I grabbed my arrow off my bow and I put it in my quiver. Um, you know, you think everything's good, hunky dory, you know, and he, he walked up and he was like, man, was that awesome or what? You know, we're talking about the two, three different bucks in the field. And I mean, I had a great night. It was my very first sit in Kansas. Um, if you guys ever hunt Kansas, Triple H Outfitters, I'll give them a little call. They're great people. Um, but, uh, just, and we, you know, we were sitting there talking and I said, all right, let's get out of here. And, uh, one step, that's all it took was one step. And, uh, I felt something poke my leg and I, I thought, so if for you guys that don't know, Milo's a big thing in Kansas. It's like a, it's, 
I don't even know what to call it. It's a, it's a, it's a grain, but it looks like a corn stalk, but about half the size. Right. Um, so what I thought when I took a step is it was just fresh cut Milo. I thought one of those Milo plants kind of stabbed me in the leg and just poked me, but I went to move and I could feel something was still poking me. And I don't know what clicked, but I had just stabbed myself that quick, that instantly still to this day, don't know exactly how it happened, but, um, Quivers, man, you got to be careful which ones you use. Tight Spot makes a great quiver, but you know at the same time, um, I if you look, there's two sets of snappers. There's an internal and an outside one, and I use micro diameter arrows. And I must have just not either pressed it in all the way, um, or um, or I don't know, maybe it's just quick quickness and me being there. Um, there's a lot of good quivers out there, you know. So, um, but it fell out of my quiver, and I don't know how. And actually, that M3. Um, that we were talking about earlier, this particular M3 is the one that I stabbed myself with. That's actually so the one right there. That's the particular one I've been keeping it around the garage because uh, I don't know if it's bad luck or good luck. So, um, But it fell out of the quiver and either knock ended into the mud or somehow magically fell where one little corn stalk landed on it. And I took one step and it was two to two and a half inches inside my calf, um, in between my shin and my in the back of my calf. Um, okay, we're going to put pictures up. Before we go any further, I'm going to put pictures up. But okay. but everybody, if you're... It's, it's gruesome, guys. It, it really is. It was... Uh, if you're squeamish, look away. <laughs> yeah, look away. It, it can it get you. Um, but yeah, two two inches into my calf. I mean, it was a brand new broadhead. I mean, it definitely shows it's the sharpest Montec ever. I'll take that crack while I can get it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm thankful my buddy was with me when it happened because... Um, I didn't know it was that severe at the time. I thought something had poked. Um, we flipped the light on. We've seen it hanging out of my pant leg and I pulled it out stupidly. I, I, I should have never done it. And, uh, as soon as I pulled it out, I didn't realize it was that deep. It felt like somebody pouring hot coffee in my boot. And this mm. was up by my knee in instantaneous instantaneous. And I, I told Donovan, I said, we got to go. We got to go now. I had about 300 yards to the truck. Uh, we made it to the truck and Donovan's like, drop your bibs. I'm like, I, I, I at this point, I, I'm already lo- losing it. I'm already loopy. And I'm like, I, I don't think we can. And, and he's like, it can't be that bad. And we took down the bibs and I don't know if the pictures are up right now. Yep, yep, yeah. Showing you. Um, it was, it was pouring, pouring out of my leg. Um, it was a very, I don't know how long it took us. All I know is I looked over the sp- speedo and I told him, don't kill us, but get me to the hospital. Um, I called the hospital on the phone. I was trying to Google. I was in and out of consciousness. Um, and, uh, yeah, I lost two and a half quarts of blood. They, they said I could have, I could have died. And if my friend wasn't with me there, we were miles from anywhere in the middle of Kansas. So, um, I strongly recommend take an extra step on what you do. Watch your broadheads, use your sharp, you know, anytime you can use a broadhead wrench, um, you know, have a, have, make sure you have service, make sure people know where you're hunting. Um, you know, I could have been still laying in that field, you know, but, uh, thank God I had, had, you know, I was with some buddies out there and they were able to help me. And, uh, it, it changed, it changed, it definitely changed your idea of what you should be prepared for. I, I just got back from Idaho and there is a tourniquet in my truck or in my backpack. Like, I don't know if I'll ever have to use it, but it, it's just something that I want there now, you know? So, Absolutely. That's um, a, that's a great tip to have. A tourniquet is not that big of an item and not no, it's, heavy. It's very items. small and, you know, we basically made a fake tourniquet out of a sweatshirt and a belt when, when we drove, when he drove me to the hospital just to kind of stop it, you know? So, um, you know, it was four or five hours in the hospital that night, first day of a hunt, um, you know, kind of ruined my hunt, you know, I, two, three days, I didn't even go out some days. I, and then after that, I really didn't climb in a tree stand, you know, for the rest of the week. Uh, you know, I was able to go out with some buddies and some buddies killed some great deer, but it, it, that fast, it can happen. And like we said, we both have, we all have kids and we all have, you know, some of us have grandkids we want to come home to. And, um, it's all about just taking that extra step and being careful. Well, you know, there's a, a guy I used to work with. Um, we talked a lot about first aid kits, and mm-hmm. especially with the area here that we live in around the, the big town, there's a lot of shootings oh, yeah. and things like that. And we always talked yeah. about Israeli bandage uh, in your kit, uh, some clots in your in your, your kit. You know, and, and really those things aren't bad to have in, in your no. field kit for, for archery or for rifle hunting, whatever. You never know when you're going to need something like that. You're, you're absolutely and, right. And, you know, like I'm the broadhead guy. I'm the guy that's not supposed to do that, and, and it happened to me, you know. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard the stories of, you know, gutting a deer and stabbing, you know, getting one of your, getting one of your arteries in your hand and well, your wrist, you know, like you said, 
you you cut your finger with a broadhead. Yeah, I've cut my finger. It, no. it, it's yeah. just, it could be simple as cutting your finger with you know. Oh, I can tighten it and this and that. But again, going back to that, whether it be your in your case your leg, uh, your fingers, mm-hmm. you, you you cut something. And if you're like you said in your instance, you're out in Kansas, and if you're yeah. out in the middle of nowhere in the UP, mm-hmm. it's like uh, okay, now what do you do? Right. Well, you know, and another thing uh, that I just remember, my dad shot a buck one year. And went to field dress it, and there was a, a piece of an arrow with a broadhead still in that yeah. deer from oh. from the season before, from somebody it else. Happens all the time, all yeah. the time. You know, you talk to local processors; they constantly. Did you take your broadhead out? Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, sure, you're going to be careful because there could be one in there. I mean, it happens all the time. You reach in there and you get something like that. It's it's crazy. I've heard tree steps breaking on on ladders. I've oh heard, yeah. Um, you know, like we are. You know, I'm in the industry. We've had guys. Um, I was talking to. Uh, I think it was. God, who's telling me this? Um, but one of the guys that from, I'm not going to name the old broadhead company, but it was one of the old two blade ones um, on a live video. He s- somehow slipped and stabbed it like into his leg mm. and actually had to put his finger inside the hole to close the artery off until they got him to the hospital. Like, I would have died. I had I would have no idea what, you know, stick your finger in there, it'll close an artery, you know? It's just those little things, just little slips here and there. And, right. you know, it, like I said, I mean, the biggest thing is if you're out there, make sure people know you're out, you know, who, who and somewhat knows where you're at. Um, you know, and, and taking an extra step, you know, I always had a first aid kit, in my, uh, my pack for out West. Um, but you know, there's a couple new items in there for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, and then you had to come home and face your wife. <laughs> yeah. And I think the worst was if I called her from Ooh. the hospital, like casual, like, Hey, I'm here, you know, like, and I sent my dad the pictures. So like my dad thought I was dying. My wife thought I had a little Nick. Um, and then nobody in camp had any other clue besides um, Donovan, the owner of the, you know, the kind of outfitting service. Um, so, like, everybody was in between of, oh, he's, he's just had a little issue to, oh, my God, he's dying, you know. So, yeah, I had to come home and explain this to my wife. And uh, it was it was kind of a joke, but kind of a little serious. We were packing an elk out in Idaho last week, and I had um, meat on my back. And uh, the guy that was kind of leading us off the mountain kind of got stuck in the swamp. And I'm like all right, well, this isn't going to work. Everybody hang back. I'm going to try to cut a trail here and uh, see if I can get us closer to instead of being in the swamp. And I slipped to my crotch, one leg in, my other leg went behind my back, knee in, and face down in the mud with 80 pounds of elk meat on my back. Um, and my wife basically found out the next day. She's like, you're going to stop going on these trips. You can keep trying to kill yourself. I'm wow. like, you know, it, 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 it's little things like that. You know I mean? I just threw my pack off. My buddy came behind me, grabbed my shoulders, pulled me out of the mud. But um, you know, it's, it's things like that. I mean, if you were out there by yourself, there's a lot of DIY guys that hunt by themselves and things like that. Right. It's just taking that extra little step. You know I mean? If it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. So if you guys want to know about bad situations in hunting, just find me on Instagram or Facebook and I'll tell you all about it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, just, like you said, just, it's, it, it, it's, it was really eye opening and it, it definitely made me, you know, think why I do it and what I do it. You know I mean? I'm always with my friends and family. So that's one thing I'm really blessed with is, is being able to do that with those people. So if something does happen, I'm, I'm usually in pretty good hands. Absolutely. Are, and, and, my, and my so. brother carries a bandana's backpack in the simplest form. A yeah. bandana can work in, in many ways too. So. He uses a tourniquet exactly. and stick. It, absolutely. So, you know, yep. it, it's just one of those things that we wanted to stress. We know here in Michigan, uh, October 1st, with the safety coming up, people are going to be climbing up and down tree stands or stands or platforms or anything. Or in this case, you were just walking. So, uh, just walking. Yep. Safety, 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 folks. Let's all get home to our loved ones and get on a good hunt and then come home, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what we're doing. Putting food on the family table and, you know, telling stories. And let's let's make sure those keep happening. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story with us. Uh, I know yeah, no it, it looks a little gruesome, but uh, if it helps somebody, <laughs> it's worth it, you know. Yeah. I, and in the long run, it would, it's been able to help, you know. Like, it was kind of funny. We went to ATA. You guys were there, but I pretty yeah. much walked around. Um, like a '90s hip hop artist, because one everybody wanted to see the hole in my leg, you know. So, right. um, but you know, I mean, it's 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 just laughs now. But at the you know at the time, it was serious. It was way more serious after than it was during. Like I didn't think I was in that bad a situation until I like kind of slowed myself down and thought. Dude, two and a half quarts of blood's a lot, you know. Absolutely, that's right. That's exactly right. You're only so. giving so much, you know. Yeah. It, it, yeah. You don't make it fast, fast as you can lose it. So, right, it, exactly. You know what? And after a story like that, I think we need to lighten it up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. What, let's take our last break. We come back. We'll uh, we'll go through uh, what you is your favorite part of the show. Well, it's not just mine, <laughs> from what I understand. All right, we're gonna step outside. We'll take a quick break. And we'll be right back after this. 
Acceleration is part of PSE's DNA. PSE pioneered the speed movement. Now they've developed the Vapor category to help you find the most powerful bows on the market to fit you. High speed equates to intense power and building the momentum you need to be successful. Are you a Vapor shooter? Find out at PSEArchery.com. Welcome back. Last segment of the show. What we've always referred to as Danny's favorite part of the show. I don't know how it became my part I of the don't show. Know. But <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. We didn't tell Brian what we're going to do here, but basically we, we just we asked you a couple fun questions and just yeah. catch you right off, you know, what you're thinking right that second. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so so the first question is, uh, you're, you're traveling out to Kansas or you're driving out to your favorite hunting spot coming up uh, whenever you're going this week. Um, and you're driving around and you're listening to something on the radio. What are you listening to? Podcast, rock and roll, country? What are you listening to? A lot of Cody Jinx right now. A lot of, a lot of new, soulful country. Um, a lot of that just kind of puts me in a happy spot. And, uh, yeah, a little bit of podcast. You know, it's that time of year you're thinking about new tactics and things like that. So a lot of, a lot of whitetail stuff. And, uh, yeah, either something kind of really peaceful, a little rock and roll-ish and, uh, or, uh, or some information. So Cody Jinx, there you go. Cody Jinx, man. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, so you, you're, you're, you're going to go, well, either you're traveling in your truck or you're, you're or out, you're out on stand. You got to have a favorite snack. What would your favorite snack be? Oh, I'm a Swedish fish guy. That is a tree stand <laughs> snack for me. So, um, so, so <laughs> seems like quiet. I remember this from ATA. Didn't we talk yeah, about yeah. this? I, I think I, we he, might have. I he might probably have. had them. Yeah. I think yeah, so. there's yeah, it's a possibility. So those are usually in the pack. Yeah, so something something this body is made on sweet. So, it's, so, uh, I'm, so I'm, I, I'm a Midwest tree stand guy, you know. So I gotta ask you, you're out you're out in Kansas or you're in Michigan. It's really cold. Those Swedish fish get a little get a little hot. They do. So do you yeah, put them in the pocket to warm them up? Yeah, you gotta yeah, put them close to the skin. Get them a little warm, a little soft, you know. And sometimes you go, you just go a little, you know, just pop one in when it's hard, you know. Get a, the longer life out of it there you go that's good stuff oh man so so okay so those are the two great questions um mike and i are coming over for dinner what are you gonna make us uh meal wise your your best recipe go-to recipe that you're gonna wow us oh bourbon glazed back straps Oh man! Oh yeah, we made them out in Idaho out of uh, elk tenderloins. But any good whiskey, a little bit of butter, and sear them hard. And they come out of the oven, slice them real thin, medium rare. That's my go-to for sure. That's the first time I've heard that with with, with oh, whiskey. Yeah. Uh, sear them real hard, a little bit of butter, a little bit of whiskey. Just let it glaze, and then put them in the oven for five ten minutes, and let them finish. Oh, they're the way to go. <laughs> Everybody that gets backstrap sliced from the processor, tell them to do chunks and do them that way. And then you slice it after you cook it. Okay. You won't go back. There you go. Jeez, oh, Pete. You won't go back. Uh, Alan Mayer says Sour Patch Kids are his go-to thing. Sour That's Patch a kids. good one. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. Make you pucker up. All right. I mean, so, the nice thing is like, you have kids now, so I can just steal handfuls of Halloween candy before I go I do now, it all the so. time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so so we've we've had this great meal. We're going to sit around the campfire, and you're going to tell us a story that, that comes to mind, uh, your favorite story, whether you're young, old, whatever it is. What, what story are you going to tell Mike and Dan? Oh, probably my first turkey story ever. Um, it's Like I said, when, when I said earlier, I mean, uh, family and friends is why I hunt and, and how I do it. Um, and my dad never turkey hunted. Um, we got a piece of property a really good buddy of ours owns over in the Yale area, which is awesome because that's right where the shop is now. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing turkey hunting. I knew all these cool new calls and decoys. <laughs> I was your typical first turkey hunter that had the vest and way too much stuff, way too much stuff, you know? And I'm trying to do calls, and my dad's just sitting back going, this 15-year-old kid looks like an idiot, you know? <laughs> um, but we were having fun, and he didn't care. And But we were hunting hard all day. We got a couple little gobbles in the morning and um, just really didn't know what we were doing. And uh, so – I, I, I had heard some gobbles on the other side of the farm. So I'm like, all right, Dad, come on, let's go over there. I know Rob's got a blind that's up. We'll just sneak into the blind and see if we can get the birds to come. And uh, so we did for a little bit. My dad, uh, typical, he's like getting tired. Oh, my back hurts. So he is out of the blind, feet inside the blind, sleeping against a tree. 
And uh, all of a sudden I get a gobble. <laughs> like, oh my God, this might actually happen, you know? <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I see it and it's coming in full strut and it's, it's, it's on a rope. And I'm like, oh my God, I actually did it. All this stuff is working, you know? <laughs> and dad is still sound asleep. And I just, I mean, his feet are next to me, the blind's tight. And I'm trying to move around and, uh, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm trying to get the shotgun out the window, you know, like, you know, everybody told me, don't move. You got to be really slow with turkeys, you know, all that stuff. Since then, I've learned a lot more about turkeys, but, um, and I get, and I'm getting the shot up, I'm getting the barrel on them. And, uh, um, I do turkey hunt with shotguns, even though I'm an archer guy most of the time. <laughs> um, but I, I kicked my dad accidentally, and my dad springs up, and he's like, what are you doing? And all of a sudden, the turkey's head just pops up at, like, eight yards. Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Shoot this bird, and my dad is freaking out. He thinks I've actually shot the gun. He thinks I'm just screwing around in the blind. Flip the blind up over on top of him, running out there. This bird's flopping. I'm trying to get it. My dad has no idea still what's going on. And the whole time... Just we're all, I mean, we just both cracked up laughing. He was sleeping. I didn't know what the hell we were doing. I knocked him over. We almost threw the hunt by waking up, you know. it's It was always like that one thing in my mind when I, I, I hunt. He's my go-to phone call. So it's that one story I always like to bring up. And just it's, It was just a funny turkey hunt. So Man, that's when you need a camera. You need a camera yeah, oh on that one. <laughs> I'm not the guy to film my own stuff, but if somebody put a camera on my shoulder, I could, you could have tons of hilarious footage. Oh, so wow. Not a lot of killing, but a lot of <laughs> funny hunting stories. So. You gotta have fun while hunting. Man. It just wouldn't be yeah, just exactly. wouldn't be without it. That is awesome. <laughs> that is good stuff, man. Right there. So that, oh. that's our questions that we got for you. But there is one added question is uh, is, is from Mark Coleman and says, Brian, have you ever dressed up as Santa for the kids? Oh God. You know what's funny about this? Like it was mentioned a couple years ago. And then we were in Idaho and the guys are like, Man, the, the beard's getting a little gray. You know, you're a little on the you know, you're a little on the round side. What do you think about doing Santa? Well, I started looking into these guys make a ton of money. So the question is if I have it, when will this beard get white enough to do it? So oh, you could be the young Santa Claus. <laughs> I was thinking more we'll keep it more uh PG, but I was thinking more like office parties, you know, than, than the hall Santa or the mall Santa. That you know? could be dangerous, man. <laughs> I know, I know you. That could be dangerous. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff, man. That is funny. Oh my, um, you know, I, I got a question I wanted to ask you. I mean, you've yeah. you've been around hunting, you know, different places. Uh, it's something mm-hmm. I've always wanted to do. You, you get out, somebody in your group takes a deer or an elk or whatever mule deer have you ever had uh fresh back straps right over an open fire oh yeah yeah so that's gotta be the um, best yeah anything a stick and a piece of meat over a fresh piece of burnt wood is i i think you can't beat that ever you know so um yeah i've been able to do it out west with some elk um been able to do a white tail you know just kind of cut the piece off right then and there um yeah I, i don't think there's a better meal out there a more satisfying meal when you're tired and um, you, you put the time in or you helped your buddy get it off the mountain or out of the tree, you know, out, out of the woods. And it, yeah, it's, there's nothing more special or delicious than that, that one bite. I, I think that's something I'm going to, I'm going to try to do this year at some point, yeah. whether it's here in Michigan or down in Indiana. It's just, to me, there's something primal about it. I just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, especially when you get back to, I mean, if, the, if you can get a fire going and, and you know, just want to get that relaxed, that wind, wind down time anyways, you know, just yeah. a little salt if you have it and you don't even need it really. And uh, just that smoke and that heat, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit uh-huh. um, too rare that we should eat it, but you know, who cares? So, right. You, you wouldn't care. That's all good Brian stuff. Need, Brian, Brian needs to have a GoPro on him at all times when he's out in the field. <laughs> who's, who's saying Tammy. that? Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and my brother calls you now Chris Kringle. All right. So all right, there dude. we go. Well, I tell you what, we're bumping up on it here on the end of the show. Um, I'm going to wrap up the podcast portion, and uh, we'll continue okay. with the live stream for just a minute. But uh, for those of you on the podcast, uh, make sure you, you get over to G5's webpage and check out what they've got over there. Get to your local pro shop. Uh, support your local pro shops. Uh, also, check us out over on our social media sites. And Danny, you'll be posting this. This, this show will go on uh, Wednesday. YouTube, typically, it'll be there by Wednesday. All right. And also, if you listen on iTunes, make sure you go over, give us a review over there. That helps us out as well. That'll do it for us this week, folks, on the podcast. Y'all take care, and we'll see you again next week. This episode was brought to you by PSE Archery, Buck Bait, Better the Hunt, Rebel 6 Rubs and Seasonings, Easy Cut, Limb Walker Game Call, Sunrise Archery. 
Total Heat, Hunter's Blend Coffee, Packer Mac, Fourth Arrow Camera Arms, Scent Blocker, Scent Lock, Copper Jack, and Stanislavski Release Aids. Thanks for listening and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.